Well, let's see. I, uh, from my earliest days that I can remember, I have loved the outdoors. I've had a deep uh, sense of nature mysticism. I've been attracted to the spiritual realm of life and having that paired with a, a sense that, that when we go deeply inside, we're called to take the light we find there out into the world. We're called to take the love we find there out into the world in service. That's pretty much been the heart of my life for now 70 years. Uh, I uh, am a, a happy husband. My wife and I are about to celebrate our 47th anniversary. I'm a doting father with a 40-year-old son and a 33-year-old daughter, a lovely daughter-in-law and son-in-law, and two 10-year-old grand twins, a boy and a girl, who live uh, right next door almost, which is lovely. Uh, my mother is 99, uh, going to be 100 when uh, September arrives, God willing. And as I think about her, I started thinking about the possibility that I could live another 30 years. And I think the question I'm carrying right now uh, it's probably a question for all of us, but I feel it pretty keenly, is if I were to live another 30 years, what is the story I would want to tell with my life over those 30 years? I would say sources of wisdom. Uh, I think the first source is the, the prime source, the, uh, eternal wisdom, the, the animating force of everything that is, uh, that I believe we access most deeply and truly through our heart. I have a dear friend, Nahid Anga, who is one of the founders of the International Association of Sufism, who leads a heartbeat meditation with an insistent refrain from time to time, listen to your heartbeat listen to your heartbeat. That deep listening to heartbeat, to me, I guess, if I had to pinpoint it, is the source of wisdom. That listening allows me to listen more deeply to and access the wisdom of the amazing people who I've been privileged to come into contact with. So many of them people that if we were just walking down the street, we might not even recognize each other. But when we take the time to listen deeply to each other, we discover the beauty of humanity together. So uh, to repeat myself, I think wisdom is available anywhere we turn if we know how to be open to listen, to look, to learn, and have the humility to receive as well as the boldness to offer. I suppose there's both what peace feels like to me personally and what my vision for peace on this planet might be. And peace for me personally is uh, being able to find my center to be in, in the, the still depth of the being I am, the, the soul that is embodied in this body that uh, carries me around with more and more creaks and, and groans with each passing decade. But to, to settle deeply into that and, and ultimately to disappear and not be anymore. Uh, that, that the distinction that is me, the boundaries that are me, disappear. And there is simply being. And when I step back from that, back into a consciousness that is me, that is deep peace. Because I feel like I'm newborn again. I've come from that source. I've come from the ultimate oneness that undergirds everything that is the autonomy uh, of love, the, um, the sovereignty of love that 
I believe is the ultimate force in the cosmos to step back from that just enough to be conscious that I am a being. That to me is ultimate peace and it allows me to look outward and see what I see in the world, first of all, from a foundation of oneness, to recognize there, there are no others. We, we are as different as we might be, we're just gloriously diverse expressions of a foundational oneness of all creation. So if I carry that a few steps farther, I guess peace in the outer world for me is not to erase difference. Because I believe, uh, you know, there's a lovely passage in the Quran that I will get part right, at least, that, that has Allah saying, uh, if I wished, I could have made you all the same. But I made you different peoples. So you might get to know each other and strive to outdo each other in doing good. Our differences are to be celebrated. And yet all too often, they are a cause for division. They, they drive us apart. For me, peace is when we are resting in a foundational experience of our identity as one that we are not different, we are all one, that we experience that on a deep level and then are able to live into, yes, we are also different. We are not different, we are different. To live into the we are different in a way that is uh, filled with curiosity, filled with appreciation for difference filled with a capacity to celebrate and uplift difference and wish for nothing more than the thriving of every being on this planet in a way that helps us realize our best, deepest, truest self made according to the religion I grew up in and am still connected with, uh, made in the image and likeness of God. Uh, not a vengeful, dictatorial, whimsical God in my mind, but a God who is at the beginning, in the middle, and the end, overflowing, undiscriminating love. Oh, that is a, a, a good question, a, 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 one that challenges even in the best of times. And since as we're sitting here, there is a, a war going on as uh, one nation invades another, or rather the leaders of one nation invade another nation and put its people in great jeopardy. Uh, um, so how do you go about building peace. Um, you know, the great uh, and recently departed Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh famously said, peace is every step. I think we have to start building peace with ourselves. I uh, started my college career in 1969 at Columbia College in New York City, which I chose because it was at that point, as far as colleges went, the epicenter of the anti-war movement in this country. Uh, and I was fiercely opposed to the US involvement in Vietnam. I discovered though, once I got there that uh, there's a difference between a peace movement and an anti-war movement. The anti in anti-war and the war in anti-war often meant that the anger, the vitriol, and sometimes even the violence of the people opposing the war uh, was every bit as disturbing to me as the war I was opposing. And I realized that what I was after was something to hold up 
something to aspire to, not trying to dismantle, to take apart, to tear down. I think the thing that, that um, more than any other experience over a couple of years uh, just sort of made clear to me the path I didn't want to take was being in Washington DC for a demonstration and seeing a group of young men commandeer a great big garbage truck uh, and push it over an embankment down onto the roadbed below. Uh, it, it could have killed any number of people and yet they were doing this because they were opposed to a war. I realized that as much as I wanted the war to stop, I couldn't support that kind of action. And so I struggled to discover what, what is the, the path to peace that I feel I'm called to walk and that I can support. And I think I found personally, I found the answer to that for me when I became the founding executive director of the United Religions Initiative, which was founded on this little glimmer of a vision that the world of religion could contribute collectively to the well being of all people on earth, of the whole earth community, in the way the nations of the world sought to contribute through the United Nations. If the nations are doing this, why can't people of religion do this uh, when too often it seemed like? religious leaders, representatives, activists, fanatics were showing up at the scene of a fire with a can of gasoline and matches. We sought to build a community around the notion that people of diverse religions, spiritual expressions, and indigenous traditions around the world could be agents for peace. So drawing on 17 years of that work, I would say for me, the path to build peace starts with, as I said, ourself. We need to cultivate the peace within us. And in doing that, then we need to see in each person we encounter that same capacity for peace. An example, there, the dominant uh, forum for interfaith work when I started seem to be uh, interfaith gatherings with uh, religious and scholarly elites. And uh, the locus of the work would be talking about uh, the differences and similarities between religions. We decided to do something different. We decided to organize in the grassroots and to invite people to imagine what kind of work they could do with people of other traditions. And in doing that, as people identified something that they could do to upbuild their community and started working side by side with people of other faiths, often uh, people of faiths they had never come in contact with. And if they had, it was mostly through hearsay and the hearsay wasn't good. You know, I'm a Muslim, I don't trust Christians. I'm a Christian, I don't trust Muslims. And that's really easy to do if all you do is read the news and hear one side of the story. I remember a gathering in, uh, in Kenya where we brought together people from a multitude of faith traditions and about halfway through the second day during uh, a break, I had someone come up to me and, and this person said, you know, I am Muslim and I almost didn't come to this gathering because I was afraid I was going to have to sit down and talk with a Christian. And I knew what Christians were <laughs> and I didn't want to talk with one. Uh, said, but I, I decided to overcome that fear and come, and I'm so glad I did, because you know what? I did have to sit down and talk with a Christian, and he was so different from what I thought. 
all the things I was afraid of weren't there. We don't agree on everything, but instead of this other person, this enemy that I never want to get anywhere near, I now feel as though I have a colleague, a friend, a brother, and we can work together. And there's plenty of work to do. Now you could say the same story again, because a Christian would come up and say, you know, I'm Christian. And I didn't want to come here because I was afraid I would have to sit down and talk to a Muslim. But I did, and I'm so glad. I saw that kind of development, men and women, young and old, all sorts of religions, because if you're only in your setting, that seems to be the definition of the problem. It's Christian against Muslim, but you go somewhere else, it's Hindu against Buddhist or Hindu against Muslim or Christian against Buddhist. And uh, for some reason, we seem to have these oppositions and always the people in power uh, think they're enough and the people who aren't are looking for help. If we can find ways to to go back to an earlier answer, stand together on at least the hope of our oneness and recognize that we live in a world that is desperately in need of repair. To use the phrase that our Jewish sisters and brothers use, tikkun olam, the world needs us to work to repair the world whether it's extreme poverty, climate change, war, uh, the subjugation of a particular kind of people, a particular gender, a particular way of understanding what it means to be human in my body. Uh, there is so much work to be done and we can't do it while we're fighting each other. So peace looks like a ceasefire and say, let's stop fighting images of each other that are based on the worst stories someone else told us about you. Let's get to know each other as human beings who have the same loves, the same fears, the same needs, and let's ask how we can open our hearts enough, how we can roll up our sleeves and work together to make even a tiny thing better. Because when we do that, our curiosity is rewarded. And we start to want to know more about someone, not because we want to understand how I can show I'm right and you're wrong, but to understand what it is about who you are and what you believe and how you've grown up that has led you to believe doing this is a good thing. And I can share why I believe doing this is a good thing. And maybe we can exhale a little bit and not need to hold these divisions and animosities. It's a slow process. It is one that is risky. We have to risk putting aside our preconceptions. We have to be brave enough to go into places we've been afraid to go before. The reward is tremendous. and. As more and more people begin to have that sort of experience, that filters out into every domain of human engagement, from the marketplace to high level diplomacy. That is the kind of transformation that elevates each person, that elevates our consciousness, and that has the potential to help create peace wherever it takes deep root. Right now, uh, it's impossible to look at any news medium, <laughs> listen to any news medium uh, without uh, feeling a rising sense of apprehension that uh, uh, the human part of this planet is placing itself in deeper and deeper and deeper trouble. Uh, that we are driving a collective car, no matter 
whether we want to be in the car with each other or not, we are driving a collective car toward the edge of a cliff at higher and higher speeds and blasting through every single warning sign to slow down. Uh, that anxiety is real and it's understandable because these are anxious times. To stay there, uh, is to me an invitation to despair. It's potentially an invitation to paralysis. It's certainly an invitation to create lots of others to blame this on uh, and to develop the kind of inner anger that I experienced in the anti-war movement, some parts of it back when I was much younger than I am now. That to me is the consciousness that uh, traps a lot of people and it is not peace consciousness even if it the clothing it wears is working for peace uh, because it's driven from a deep and fearful place and I, I don't want to diminish the reality that there are a lot of fearful things going on in a, a poem I wrote, I talk about humanity being on the edge between promise and menace. The menace is real and it gets more real every day. So peace consciousness. Uh, if what I was just talking about bears some resemblance to what Martin Luther King often referred to as the fierce urgency of now. We are here now, things are desperately wrong and they need to change. And there is a moment here and now, and we call it the fierce urgency of now, we need to act. It's possible to be in that place from a place of anxiety and despair. That is not peace consciousness. And I don't believe it was the way Martin Luther King led his life and led a movement. Because the other time frame he talked about, he, he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. For me to cultivate peace consciousness is to find my place on that long arc of the moral universe and to know that that arc has been there for thousands of years, uh, who knows, maybe billions. Uh, and there's not anything any one person ever does that causes it to change dramatically. It is long and it bends, but bends toward justice. For me to abide in a sense that I am one part of deep time, I am one part of deep change. I am one expression of the fathomless and often bewildering power of love. If I can reside in that place, then I have a fighting chance, wrong word. <laughs> I have a chance to abide in the fierce urgency of now from a place that is grounded in peace because it believes that it's how I and we are and how we do what we do in the here and now that will predispose anything toward peace. If the how, the what are done from a place of deep grounding in the sense that we're part of a venture that is so much bigger than any of us and all of us, an venture that at its heart is grounded in and guided by love, uh, then we have an opportunity to navigate the difficulties, as Martin Luther King again would say, the difficulties of today and tomorrow. And he would say again and again, and this is peace consciousness to me, that even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. That to me is peace consciousness, that you can be in the 
often ugly, violent, dirty mix of the moment and never lose sight of the dream of peace that is calling you forward. One of the great joys in my life is, is being privileged to accompany uh, a few people in different parts of the world who uh, might fall for me into that category of future generations. They're, they're now, they're here and now, and they're leading magnificently in their own ways. They just happen to be a few decades behind me in journeys around the sun. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of uh, learning a lot in my life and to be able to share a little bit of what I've learned with other people uh, in the hopes that it might help them from, keep them from falling into some of the potholes I fell into of taking the, the, the wrong fork in the road that, that I might have taken, at least to, to offer questions that can help uh, people find their truest answer in challenging times. Uh, not only is the future yours, but the present is yours. Uh, one of the things that I realized oh, maybe 20 years ago as I was despairing at some point about the accelerating uh, negative impact of humanity on the environment and seeing all these things disappear and experiencing just this deep sense of loss was that each new generation has a baseline and it's a different one. The world looked very different when you were 10 than it did when I was 10. Things that I experienced at 10 <clears throat> that have vanished and so that I might experience as loss, you never knew, except maybe to read about in a history book. And that doesn't uh, actually substitute very well for the actual experience. Uh, part of what I realized in that was it was unfair of me to place limits around anything based on my sense of loss and my sense of what might be possible to someone of a different baseline. I needed to be elevated and drawn forward by what someone who came into the world later than I did, who saw things differently because of that, what that person saw, what that person hoped for, the possibilities of, instead of being confounded, for instance, by the world of technology, to see possibilities that left on my own, I could never imagine. Uh, so I guess my, my, uh, my word to people of younger generations than mine is, uh, be my teacher, please. I, I need to learn from you. People my age, we need to learn from you. And yes, you, you can learn from us too. Let's learn together. Let's be mutually respectful. Let's walk arm in arm uh, and let our high ideals uh, match the place where our feet touch the ground. And let's see what we can build together. It's never going to be perfect, uh, but it's going to be magnificent if we let our hearts guide us. Uh, and maybe the last thing is uh, a poem. I haven't mentioned I'm a poet, but I'm a poet also. And this is a, a poem I would offer in closing. And it's called, Let Us Dance. Each of us will die one day. It doesn't matter. More important is to practice living. Still all that does not meet our truest becoming. Listen to the music of the universe inviting us to begin the dance that is ours alone. The beloved has been waiting from before time for our first step, for our next step. No matter our age, our life is new in this moment. 
let us dance. <laughs>